Hi everyone, welcome to our first ever showcase session. Uh, we welcome to our session. The first talk uh, will be coming all the way from Australia. And uh, we have two great speakers. We have, um, um, let's see, Joseph Lizier and Leonardo uh, in here with us. And uh, um, we will handle this session uh, very similar, uh, in a very similar way with the main talk. We will have uh, uh, the speakers taking the microphone in a minute. Uh, please go ahead and ask questions. Uh, you have the bottom at the bottom of the screen. Ask a question. Uh, pause there your questions. Uh, initially, you will be muted, and uh, you can also um, vote on questions. And uh, after 25, roughly 25 minutes of speech, we will give open the session for Q and A. Uh, and uh, I'm going to let you go live uh, and ask the question yourself. So, Joseph, you want to take over? Sure, shall do. Uh, I take it you can still hear me okay? Nothing's changed since we left the green room. Uh, okay, thank you very much, uh, Anka, and thank you uh, for the opportunity to talk today. Uh, uh, can everyone see my, can you see my slides okay? Everything. Yeah, excellent. Okay, so thank you very much for the uh, the opportunity to, to talk today in, in the software showcase. And in particular, thanks to the organizers for getting CNS up. After all, it's obviously a bit of a crazy time for everybody. So uh, Leo and I are from the University of Sydney. Our software showcase today is going to be about using information theory and directed network inference in particular in a computational neuroscience setting uh, using the JDT and IDT Excel toolkits. Uh, we've only got half an hour and it's uh, very early on a Sunday morning for us. So what can we hope to achieve? Well, our uh, session is split into three parts. And that aligns with the three takeaways uh, that we hope uh, you come away with today. The first is uh, by way of background. We'd like you to take away an appreciation of what information theory can tell us in a computational neuroscience setting. Then we'll move on to the toolkits. Firstly, JDT, which is a fundamental information theoretic engine. Uh, in the short time, all we can really hope for you to take away is an understanding of what it offers and being able to get started. To help you get started, there are two particular tools that I'll, uh, I'll show you. The first is a, a GUI tool that comes with JDT, which we call the Auto Analyzer. It allows you to get started with very simple push button analysis without writing any code at all. It also generates code templates for you, which is a great way to get started and start building on that to doing something more complicated. JDT also now ships with a short uh, course, uh, including lecture slides and about 45 to 15 minute short video lectures uh, that gives you both background to using information theory for analyzing complex systems and in particular using JDT to get started doing that. Then I'll hand over to uh, Leo, who will uh, describe the IDT Excel toolkit, which is a higher level toolkit providing higher level algorithms on top of uh, the underlying information theoretic engine, in particular for effective network inference. Uh, all of the resources today are available via our tutorial web page. Uh, let me just flick over to that quickly for you. I've put a link. I've put a link for the tutorial web page in uh, uh, the Crowdcast chat right at the top. It's also on Sked and on the CNS uh, tutorials homepage. Uh, and it has links, as I say, for all, all the tools, for uh, the Google Groups, for the course, and so on. Okay, so let's start uh, with some background. Uh, as I say, we don't have a whole lot of time today. This is going to be a very, very high level background. I'll just show you a couple of slides from within uh, the information theory short course that we have. Obviously, we don't really have time to go uh, very deeply into the definitions of information theory. Suffice to say, I just wanted to highlight that information, uh, we define it by the amount uh, by which one variable, uh, be that an answer to a question, uh, a signal or a measurement, particularly in, in brain imaging data, uh, reduces our uncertainty or surprises us about another variable. So information theory, uh, information is always about what one variable tells us about another uh, 
specifically in terms of how much it reduces our surprise. So to do this, we need to quantify both uncertainty, which we do using the fundamental quantity, the entropy, as well as uncertainty reduction. And that's what information is. Again, I don't want to really go into the maths today. I'm just putting this up here to make the point that uh, the definitions of entropy, mutual information, the conditional variance and so on are very rigorously mathematically defined. Uh, and you can have a look through our, our short course if you want some more uh, more detail on that. If you, if you don't know what these uh, quantities are uh, right now, you're not going to know in the next, uh, next 10 minutes. That's a, a deeper question. So for the moment, I'll push on assuming that you understand what these, uh, what these quantities are. Uh, I will give you a little bit of intuition, though, uh, to, to, to think about why we might be interested in using these measures in computational neuroscience. Uh, in my short course, I like to give uh, an example of the game Guess Who. Uh, if you haven't played Guess Who, it's kind of like 20 questions. Each player starts with uh, a board of, of 24 characters, uh, and they're given one of those characters as their own character, and they have to guess who the other person has as their character using a sequence of yes or no questions by which they can start eliminating some of the possibilities. They can ask yes or no questions about the traits of those characters, like is your character male or female? Do they have blue eyes? Do they have blonde hair? And so on. What I really like about that game is there are a lot of things we can ask with information theory that tell us uh, interesting details about what's going on. We can ask about how surprising a different trait, each trait for their character is. We can ask about how much uncertainty there is in the person's identity. We can ask about how much uncertainty reduction we get about the identity from one of the traits. We can ask about uh, the information that's held in common between two traits and so on. When we switch across to a computational neuroscience setting, there are analogues of all of those questions. If we take a classic face house discrimination task experiment, we can ask how surprising each stimulus is. We can ask about how much uncertainty there is in the stimulus. We can ask about, uh, for example, if we've put someone in the scanner, we can ask about the uncertainty reduction about the stimulus if we know uh, the activity that's going on in area one. We can talk about how much information area one gives us about area two. We can do this in a, in a dynamic sense. If we have time series for these, we can look at how that information moves over time or, or flows over time and so on. So what I really like about using information theory for neural data analysis is that it allows us to answer these questions that are very naturally phrased in this setting. It allows us to answer them in a model-free way. It captures nonlinearities in the relationships between the different uh, variables in the data. And it provides us a bunch of different estimators for different data types, like discrete value data or continuous value data, and even spiking data. And finally, it handles multivariates in a very natural way. So we can use information theory to answer questions such as these. We can ask about the nature of neural codes. We can ask about functional relationships, directed functional relationships, effective network structure, which Leo will, will come on to soon. We can talk about uh, modeling uh, the dynamics of information processing in particular. Usually we're dealing with large multivariate time series here. We could think about fMRI as an example where we have a number of uh, variables or time series processes being uh, uh, the, the, the activity of the different voxels over time or the regions of interest. And we can ask uh, about the information processing dynamics in terms of looking at how each of those processes updates its value over time. And we can look at those updates as a local computation in the system, asking where the information in that computation comes from, looking at the past of the process looking at information flowing from other processes and so on to establish an information theoretic footprint of what's happening in the underlying uh, processing taking place here. So that's where I'll leave the, the quick overview of why we think information theory is important in a computational neuroscience setting. Uh, we've got whole workshops uh, talking about this at CNS. There's uh, our own workshop uh, on methods of information theory uh, in computational neuroscience. Where have I, where have I got this? our own workshop on methods of information theory and computational neuroscience, which I'm chairing. Uh, this is another workshop as well. I think it's called uh, modeling, uh, uh, modeling neuroscience using information theory. So if that all sounds interesting, please do come along uh, to, the, to the workshops. Let's leave the motivation there and push on to our particular toolkits though. This is a sh software showcase after all. Uh, JDT and IDT Excel are complementary. Uh, we see them relating in the following manner. JDT is more about providing 
easy use of the core estimators here, uh, providing easy use of mutual information, transfer entropy, and so on. It's a fundamental engine uh, for implementing these measures. IDT Excel is more about providing higher level algorithms on top of that engine for things like uh, effective network inference. There are more subtleties to the differences between them. I, I won't really go so much into them uh, today. One of the subtleties is that JDT is more, uh, more intended for beginners, providing things like the GUI to help you get started really easily here, whereas IDT Excel is a, requires a bit more advanced use, usage. So let me give you a quick overview of JDT. Uh, as I say, it's, it's a fundamental information theoretic engine. It provides a standalone implementation of different information theoretic measures for information processing in complex systems. Primarily, it provides implementations for the transfer entropy, the mutual information, uh, and their conditional variance. Uh, it provides implementations of these measures to handle different data types for both discrete data, continuous value data, and we've got some specific estimators for spiking data coming soon. And we have different estimators for different uh, that have different pros and cons for these different data types as well. We have estimators that uh, handle linear relationships only, as well as more complicated uh, nonlinear estimators, such as the, the well-known KSG estimator. As uh, as uh, one U.S. president might say, we have all of the estimators. We have more estimators than than anybody else. Uh, the uh, the code's all available on on GitHub. Uh, as I say, the links are uh, provided in our um, software tutorial homepage. Uh, on GitHub, we have quite a lot of documentation, which I'll, I'll mention again soon, a, a fairly large wiki there. Uh, the code credits here I probably should have mentioned earlier. It's not just uh, Leo and I behind these toolkits. In fact, uh, Leo's not behind JDT at all. He's on the IDT Excel side. Uh, we have some really, uh, really cool contributors here, including uh, for JDT and IDT Excel, Pedro Mediano, who is uh, giving a plenary session at, at CNS uh, tonight, Australian time. I'm not sure what time for, for the rest of you. Leo will mention the other contributors for IDT Excel when we come to that. Uh, a couple more details about JDT. The J stands for Java. That's only because it's written in Java. It's directly usable in MATLAB, in Python, and uh, many other languages as well, and requires pretty much zero installation. Uh, asterisk, see, see details later. Uh, coming with it is a, a paper describing its design and usage. There's a fairly large wiki that comes with it as well. You've seen some of those links there already. Uh, it ships now with a course. It, it's very much... Uh, alpha, uh, not even beta quality yet. Uh, the, uh, the slides for the course uh, ship directly with, with the toolkit. Uh, as I say, there's a whole suite of short video lectures uh, that are there now as well to go with the slides. There's about 45 to 15 minute uh, video lectures there. So if you're interested in understanding um, uh, the background to information theory for complex systems, as well as getting started with JDT, that could be of interest for you. Perhaps most important are the demonstrations, uh, in particular our GUI demonstration, which provides push button analysis and, and code template generation. And it is really the easiest way to get started. Let's have a, a look at that. Uh, so I'm now in the, the top level uh, directory of a, of a J, JDT instance. I can start our, our auto analyzer and what I get is firstly a choice of what particular measure I want to estimate from some data. So we'll choose the, the transfer entropy. Once I've got that, I can pick, to, I can choose which estimator type I'd like to use, and then I can choose a data set. Now, for the purposes of uh, our, our GUI tool, the way we, uh, the way our data sets are laid out is that we have variables or, or time series processes in columns, and the different rows of the data set give the different samples of the data. Or for a time series, there is specific uh, samples at, at each consecutive point in time. This is only the way we've laid it out for the GUI tool. Uh, you, can, you don't have to use this data format. You can have a completely different data format as long as you can read that data in and get it into the toolkit. Once we've, we've got that, we pick, uh, we pick our data file out. We can then tell the, tell the toolkit which, uh, which column is which, which is the source, which is the target, 
We can set a whole bunch of uh, parameters here. And once we're ready to go, we just click our generate code and compute. And we get an answer for our information theoretic measure here without having written any code at all. And not only that, it generates some code templates for us here in Java, in Python, and in MATLAB. So you can recreate this exact calculation uh, for the exact estimator, the exact data set, the exact parameters by uh, taking this code here. For example, I'll, I'll just take that one there for MATLAB. We'll, we'll go and we'll paste this into MATLAB over here. And we get exactly the same answer out in the end. And that's really important because you can then take that code and build on it. You could put a for loop in to loop over trials or subjects, or you could change uh, the way that we load the data in. As I say, this is just done as something easy to have uh, the GUI tool, but you can load the data in, in, in any other way that you like, taking this, uh, this template and building on it. Okay, so that's about all I wanted to say about JDT for the moment. Uh, it is a raw information theoretic engine to do more complicated things on top of that, such as effective network inference. You can look at IDT Excel, and at this point, I'll hand over to Leo uh, to talk about IDT Excel himself. All right. Thank you, Joe. I'll switch to my screen now. All right, can you hear me well and see my screen? Is that good? Uh, we've still just got your browser. For me, oh, there for we me it's, it's lagging quite a bit, but okay. There we go, we're good. Oh. All right. Here, here we go. So thanks, Joe, and thanks, everyone, um, for attending the showcase. As Joe said, IDT Excel is um, for um, toolbox for network inference. So we are not just analyzing uh, typically pairs of relationships, but we are doing that in the context of a network. And typically, we have several variables we want to analyze over time. And we do that uh, target by target and then combine them in a, uh, in a whole network. And we start with a single target here, for example. Which sorry, is Leo, we're, we're, sorry, Leo, we're still seeing it in edit mode. We're not seeing the presentation. Oh, that's... Um, uh, you might have only shared the, the browser window, but not the, um, the presentation window. Okay, sorry about that. Let me try again. So, um, what what can I change that? I think I think when you share, you might need to share the whole desktop so it shares every screen. Yeah, I'm just I the probably browser. have to interrupt my screen share first somehow yeah. um, you can click on that little cross that popped up over uh, see that cross that just oh. popped up near near the top yeah 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 just do an entire screen that should hopefully do that How about now? Yeah, we're good. It's coming through. Yep. All right. Sorry about that again. Um, I hope you could see that, at least in the slide mode. I was uh, explaining how we have different variables over time with a maximum time horizon of lags we look at. And for each target, uh, time series with a present state, we first look at its past, its own past, and embed embedded first in a non-uniform way, which means we select variables from the past of the target that uh, would reduce the uncertainty we have or entropy about the current state of the target. And once this is done for the target, 
we do exactly the same and move at looking all the other candidate variables in the past of the other sources and include them one by one in a greedy way um, with the same criteria of reducing the uncertainty by the current state of the target over uh, what's already reduced by the past state and what the other variables that were previously selected um, already did. And at each step, statistical uh, tests are performed as well to only include variables that are um, reduce this uncertainty in a statistically significant fashion. So um, Joe already gave uh, an overview of IDT Excel and how it relates to JDT. JDT forms um, the engine behind it or running under the hood. And IDT Excel provides the algorithms operating uh, on top of this core, implementing these measures for different uh, purposes. And most relevant for this conference is neuroscience, but there could be other applications other algorithms that can be built around the core estimators, both for CPUs in GIDT, but we also have estimators uh, implemented for GPU usage using uh, OpenCL. And uh, DTXL will handle the parameter selection on uniform embedding, as I was just quickly trying to show in the previous slide. And it also performs a set of statistical tests, in particular, what we call the max statistics. Uh, obviously, we don't have time to go into that now, but if you're interested, you can look at the paper introducing IDT Excel here and the paper introducing um, the, the greedy algorithm and explaining a bit more. And um, as I said, as Joe said, actually, um, this is done uh, in collaboration with um, uh, quite a few people. It's not definitely not just my effort and particularly Patricia Volstad and Michael Vibral at the time in Frankfurt and uh, our collaborators, uh, Pedro Mediano, Conor Finn and more. And you'll find all the lists, obviously, on our uh, GitHub page. So um, quick uh, overview of how uh, simple analysis in IDT Excel could be. Obviously, there could be more setting that we can add. But at the very minimum, we just um, have a couple of imports here, generate the data in this case, uh, because it's just, uh, just a demo. Otherwise, we would um, uh, create an object uh, data and import the empirical data we have. In this case, we are just generating some autoregressive data for a demo. I'll quickly run it as well. And then initialize the analysis object, which in this case is multivariate transfer entropy that I'm putting here. Could be bivariate or uh, could be mutual information or other things, other measures that are provided as well. Most importantly, we have to define uh, the settings. And the estimator is clearly a very important uh, thing to choose here. In this case, I generate some other aggressive data with Gaussian noise. So I'm just going to use a Gaussian estimator, but more in general, we can use the KSG or Kraskov estimator uh, for capturing nonlinear relationships as well. And the max lag and mean lag of the sources define that time horizon that I was showing on the slide. So how far back we are looking in the past of each variable. After doing that, the analysis is just run by uh, running the anal analyze network, passing the settings and the data and uh, there's some quick plotting as well. So let me quickly flick to um, oh, one more thing. There are this example and many more are found on, can be found on the GitHub under uh, Wiki. There's a very first example here, which is pretty much what I'll be running. And then there's a bit of theoretical background and more tutorials here with more demos. So just to give you an idea of what kind of um, output you can uh, you can get while running this analysis, is I'm just running one with two nodes. So it's a very trivial analysis. We have just two nodes, not zero. Um, the link has been inferred from zero to node one with delay one. That's not really what I wanted to show you. Uh, it's more about showing what type of uh, output we get while it runs, which gives us an idea of what's going on. There are different uh, steps we are analyzing target by target. For target one, we only have one source to analyze in this case. Otherwise, if we were in a larger network, we would have several more. And the first step is including the target candidates, as I was showing on slides. And since I set a time um, horizon, let's say, of five, we have five potential variables in the past of the target to embed. And this is going to be done one by one, according to the one that is picked at every iteration is the one that maximally reduces the uh, entropy or uncertainty about the target. So the, um, first of all, the target variable with lag one is included. 
and it's, it passes the statistical significance test. And then another one is tested, but it doesn't pass. So the, the iterative algorithm stops here for the target. And then it does exactly the same for the sources. We're not really interested in this, uh, in this case in other statistical tests that are done for larger networks. You can definitely uh, find more about in the paper. And then the final source um, that is found for target one is just source zero with a lag of one. And that's why we only have one link that we saw in that little uh, network visualization. Okay. Uh, very quickly, we also validated the algorithm on large networks for up to 100 nodes, and we checked that the recall and the precisions are um, quite robust with respect to network size, um, definitely more um, than we first expected given how large, uh, how quickly the state space um, grows. And we tested it on vector autoregressive processes uh, and also a couple logistic maps, which is nonlinear and chaotic. What is quite important is to see that the precision is uh, is controlled quite well, which means uh, this is related to the false positive um, rate control. And we've done this first validation test in on random networks, but more recently you can find an archive of paper where we are also starting to study different network structures, so like smaller network or scale-free network, and more. Okay, so to conclude, uh, we really had three parts uh, to this showcase. We had the first part where Joe introduced um, a bit of uh, information theoretic concepts and how they can be used in a neural setting. And then there was a JDT uh, brief overview where just showed uh, a GUI, also mentioned there is a course and many more uh, tutorials and a lot of more information on the JDT um, GitHub as well. And finally, we had a quick look at IDT Excel and how it uses a greedy algorithm to uh, embed um, the past and of the target and sources to find relevant variable in a network setting. So thank you very much. And I think we'll open for questions in the last few minutes. OK. Uh... Thank you. Right. Do you want to select the questions or should we just pick them out of the, the Q&A ourselves here? So I invite them on the screen, yeah. one by one. Yeah. Okay, for some reason it doesn't allow me more than three. So maybe if you stop sharing screen, um, yeah. or you can just go ahead and uh, yeah. uh, pick up. Maybe we'll the do that. Page. They look fairly straightforward anyway. So so maybe people can add in the comments if they want to, or add a comment to them if they want to um, clarify. But the top voted question here is: uh, Could your tool be used in an online or streaming fashion? Stream in data and report the current stats in a continuous way. That's a really good question. That's actually something that uh, we're looking at in, in a consulting project at the moment, which uh, I, I shouldn't really be saying too much about. But uh, to answer the question, certainly, yes, there are different different ways and choices of how to do that. Um, uh, there are different ways and choices of how to do that. Uh, for example, what you could do is have a certain amount of data that you start with and you initialize the estimators on. You could start taking... Uh, new data in and evaluating, uh, basically looking at the real time or what we call the local or pointwise uh, information flows, for example, on those new data samples based on the probability distributions estimated on the old samples uh, and look at them as the, the new data comes in. And then perhaps every so often uh, you can do kind of a, a batch update of your probability distribution functions um, uh, for evaluating uh, the, the, the measures on the new data that's coming in. I hope that makes uh, some sense. It's probably as deep as we can go in the Q&A. We're happy to, happy to chat about you over email or, or something later on. So there's no uh, fundamental questions in the algorithm that you're using to update every 
one second of brain uh, data that you receive? It depends on the estimator type. So, uh, so the estimators for the discrete uh, data are much easier to, to update uh, very quickly. So for the discrete data, uh, you're basically operating on, on counts of samples uh, that match, um, uh, match your, um, let's say your templates for, for if you're trying to do information flows, you're looking at a source value, a target value and a target pass. So you sort of have a, a template there. Uh, for discrete data sets, you're just counting. So it's very easy to update those counts in, in real time as you go. For the other data types, um, say for continuous data, it's more difficult to uh, to update on the fly. It is possible, but it's going to be much easier if you kind of do batch updates. So you might do, um, let's say, let's say every few minutes or or every half hour or something, you might update your uh, probability distribution functions and then evaluate uh, the the point wise measures on the the new data that comes in based on uh, your last batch update. Uh, I hope that makes that makes sense. It makes sense. Um, I'll I'll send you um, a question on GitHub to discuss further Sounds because good. I think I have some more things in mind. Thank you so much. No worries. Uh, so, Arthur, uh, if I pronounce correctly. Correct. Uh, yeah. Please go ahead with your other questions. I've, this is more, um, if I understood it correctly, what you said. You you say your software is an alpha version. No, sorry, it's it's not the software that's in alpha. I, I, I labeled the uh, course uh, as alpha. Uh, the, the just the slides and the um, and the short videos that go with that. There's much more okay. that I want to do there. I've got big plans on having a, a MOOC or something around that. So what's there at the moment is just slides, some videos. There's no structure, no activities. So that's that's why that's alpha. But the the software certainly isn't. Uh, that was my primary question. Th thank you so much. Then no uh, thank you so much for the talk. Thank you. Um, okay, there are okay. questions about um, the greedy algorithm here. Yeah, I can take that. So yeah. let me see. Anka cannot hear you. That's okay. You don't need to. Oh, Why don't you just... Anyway. So, so um, um, the anyway, next... I'll take that from Alice I invite her on the screen yeah thank you anyway I'll start taking that anyway so um, the yes there is definitely a greedy optimization going on and the only uh, the only source of so yes it, you can get very slightly different results every time and mostly that's due to statistical testing so at every um, at every step each variable is uh, the significance of each um, let's say conditional mutual information value or transfer entropy is tested again, uh, typically a null distribution that it's often done uh, via surrogates, especially if we don't use the Gaussian estimator or discrete estimator. And uh, so depending on how surrogates are generated and a slight uh, noise that is uh, added, added, each, um, added in each computation, for example, in the Kraskov estimator there's a very uh, tiny amount of noise that is added. So that can, um, could, slightly change the order in which variables are included and being a greedy algorithm that could potentially influence the last the final result uh, but typically it's fairly robust obviously that depends on how long your time series are as well does that make sense so it's fairly robust you expect to get very similar results from different runs uh yeah if you can can hear me yeah this Okay. Um, Not very clear. Yeah. Uh, kind of set to make sure that you get the same results every run or something like that. Sorry, I cannot hear you very well. Uh, I think Alice was asking it. about uh, how can you, can is there a way to fix it to get exactly the same results uh, every time? Uh, in principle, you could set a random oh. seed to do that. I actually can't remember whether we have that implemented in the toolkit or not. Uh, Leo, you might be able to clarify, but in principle, we could do that. But it, it's it's so small, the uh, the level of randomness there that uh, I, I'm not sure that, that we prioritize that. Hmm. I'm okay. not sure if the seed is uh, implemented either at the moment. I I'd have, I'd have to double check that. I can get back to you. Hmm. Um, Anka, we'd love Thanks. to keep answering questions, uh, but you probably need to get to your next speaker. I know we've, we've 
I see we've gone a bit over time. Uh, we'll we'll happy, happily handle the rest of the questions on, on Neurostars. Okay, yeah. on... Um... Go ahead and uh, uh, post your questions on, on Neurostars. Um, we are really late. <laughs> uh, okay. It's cold, but we are really late, so um, thank you for a great talk. Um, thank you. And I'm inviting on the screen uh, our next speaker, who also comes uh, um, from... Uh, Uh, Australia and um, let's see here we are hello <laughs> uh, hello I've just got you yeah um, the same uh, please post your questions and at the end we will pick it up from here and I will turn uh, your video on so we can have a real discussion online. <laughs> and uh, if we run over the time, we can have the luxury of five minutes over, uh, no problem. Uh, but uh, we don't want to be very late. Um, so maybe we continue those discussions. If something is left, left unanswered, to, uh, we will continue those uh, discussions on Neurostars. Uh, Stuart? All right, thank you, Anka. Let me just share my screen. Share entire screen. Okay, so you should be seeing my slides, Brain Dynamics Toolbox. Is that correct, Anka? I can't see any messages on full screen, so I'm just going to no. go ahead and watch. All good, we can see you very nice. Ah, uh, very good, lovely. Okay, so this is the Brain Dynamics Toolbox, and today's showcase is to give you a flavor for what the toolbox can do for you in your research and in your teaching. Uh, the Toolbox was a collaborative project between myself and Michael Brakesby at the uh, QIMR Berghofer Medical Research Institute. Uh, Michael's since moved to the University of Newcastle, Australia, and I'm at the Victor Chang in Sydney. Okay, so the Toolbox is uh, essentially a graphical MATLAB toolbox for simulating dynamical systems in neuroscience. Um, and what it gives you is the ability to plot and interactively explore the dynamics of your system without any graphical programming effort. Uh, essentially, you give it your set of differential equations and it takes care of calling the solvers on your behalf and plotting those results. So it gives you the ability to focus on the core dynamics, the core dynamical principles of your study and forget about the programming burden. Now it's intended for computational neuroscience, but you can use it for any field with dynamical systems. Um, but it does support the three major classes of dynamical systems that you find in computational neuroscience. So that's ordinary differential equations, delayed differential equations, and stochastic differential equations. And the toolbox will allow you to construct any of these three types of differential equations into partial differential equations as well, using the method of lines. And so you can see here that the, the, uh, the graphical controls and will accept uh, two-dimensional variables, um, which are mat uh, MATLAB matrices. And uh, so you can do um, spatial systems as well as point models. So let's consider how the toolbox works. So, so firstly, let's consider how you would normally do your simulations in a uh, in a neural dynamics or, or computational neuroscience. So you usually begin with some neural dynamics of interest. Uh, you convert that to a an equivalent circuit diagram. <coughs> Pardon me. So you equate you 
you derive your equivalent circuit diagram and when, then you then transform that into a set of differential equations, which you then simulate numerically to get a time series. Frog in my throat, excuse me. All right. So traditionally what you do, especially in MATLAB, is you have your equations, um, someone may have given them to you or you've written them yourself, and you will create this ODE function in MATLAB and you will pass a hand, and that, and that function represents the right-hand side of your differential equation. You will then pass that function to the MATLAB solver, and the MATLAB solver will repeatedly call your function to generate that time series output. Now, that's all well and good. Um, people do this routinely. Uh, the problem happens when you start doing this a lot, and you get to the point where you wish you had some sort of graphical interface where you could just change the the parameters of your model or change the outputs without going back and recoding uh, this workflow every time. So that's what the toolbox does. You still have to write your ODE function, and that's important because uh, the toolbox is designed in an equation-centric manner so that you have full control over those dynamical systems that you are modeling, but it takes care of plotting the output and calling the solver on your behalf. And this is the architecture of the toolbox, so you can understand how it works better. Essentially, the toolbox is the uh, has this hub and spoke architecture where you provide your custom models, and it connects your custom models to the numerical solvers that come with MATLAB. Uh, the, the, these are mostly MATLAB solvers, but the ones with asterisks are additional solvers which are provided with the Brain Dynamics toolbox. And it also comes with a set of uh, display panels or plotting routines. So you can write any model you like and apply any, you can apply any of these numerical solvers and any of these display panels to your particular model. So that gives you great combinatorial power with very little programming effort. All you have to do is write the right hand side of your model. <coughs> oh, uh, me. So this is what our model looks like. Um, what we have here, line 72 to 95, are the actual is the actual definition of the right hand side of a, a network of Heinemarsh Rose neurons. Um, this is what you would normally write anyway. The first uh, 50 or so lines of this code really are just setting up the names of the variables uh, and the sizes of those variables for the GUI program to run. And this particular code, you can see it's less than 95 uh, lines, gives you this entire application that you see running here. And that's, uh, that's quite a typical size for many models in the toolbox. Uh, the example models generally are less than 100 lines of code, and you get all this graphical application uh, for that. Now, you don't have to use the graphical interface. There is also a set of command line tools which come with the toolbox, and you can use those when you want to simulate large models offline or automate large parameter surveys. And I'll get to a bit of that later on. So here's a list of the example models that come with the toolbox currently. There's about 30 of them. Um, that list is growing all the time. Uh, what I wanted to do is instead of telling you about the toolbox, I thought I'd just show it to you and uh, then you get a better idea of how it works. So we're going to have a look at the Wilson Cowan ODE, the point model of the Wilson Cowan. So let's switch over to MATLAB. Now I've had the toolbox installed already, obviously, but if I go help Wilson Cowan, It will give me some uh, brief help text describing how to run the model. It tells you about the equations. And this is the essential uh, part here. This is the way that the toolbox works in general. You have a, a custom script that you would write, which produces, which defines the model and returns the model in a system struct. And then you pass that system structure to BD GUI, which is the Brain Dynamics graphical user interface. And that's where you run it. So let's do that. Sys equals Wilson, Wilson, oh, I've got to spell it right, Wilson Cowan, 
There's the system structure. It has the pointer to the right-hand side, the ODE function that you've defined, and some definitions of variables and parameters and other things. Now let's pass that to the Brain Dynamics GUI to run it. Okay, this is the GUI. This describes the model that we're running. You can see in the wilson cow model, we have two state variables, E and I. E is for the excitatory population of cells, and I is for the inhibitory population. And here on the control panel are the E and I initial conditions. Uh, this particular model has some weights between the two populations of cells, the Ws, and here are the parameters here on the right-hand side. Bs are the thresholds, and the Js here are injection currents to the, to the neurons. So these injection currents represent uh, incoming synaptic um, imports from, say, some sensory system. We can switch through these panels up here and get different displays of that output. Uh, here we have the time plot of the E variable and the I variable below it. So if I just ramp up the injection current JE, so I hope you can see this, I'm using the slider here to change that parameter JE, and we can see the onset of this oscillation in the system. So this is all computing in real time. Now we can also look at that in a phase portrait. Phase portrait plots E versus I. Um, you can see this trajectory is a bit jagged, so we can swap the solver to ODE23, get a smoother trajectory. Um, we can show the vector field. The vector field shows the flow in the phase field. Uh, and we can show the null clients. And as we adjust our injection current, we can see the, we can see it's a bit slow, I think, because of this video streaming, uh, but uh, we can see the null clients shifting upwards and the limit cycle changing. I'm going to turn off these vector fields. All right, so let's say we want to look at the steady state. We can use this time slider here to trim off the transients. And we can see that better here in the time portrait. If I change this slider here, it's a very slow to update, I'm sorry, but you get the idea that we are now plotting the steady state here and we're sort of ignoring these transient parts in light gray. Here they are in light gray here. So we can turn those off, turn off transients, and just look at the steady state solution as we manipulate our parameters. So with that, we could make a bifurcation diagram, for example. That's a typical analysis you might like to do. So let's create a new panel. Bifurcation. There it is. Let's make a 3D view. Uh, that's our transient, and that's our steady state. Let's get rid of that transient. We don't like that. Now, the x-axis, we want JE. That's our bifurcation parameter. The y is the i variable, and the z-axis is e. So that's fine. So now, as I change my injection current to that, oops, sorry, injection current to that side of result, you can see, oh, I'm pressing the wrong one, not J, I, J, E. You can see we're building up a bifurcation diagram of that system. I'm struggling a bit here. I think the video and MATLAB are fighting it out a bit. Okay. So what we can do 
is use the MATLAB workspace to also manipulate the parameters in this GUI. Uh, you'll remember that I returned this handle here when I ran uh, BD GUI, and this gives us uh, access to the internal states of the graphic user interface. So now I can control the graphical user interface from the command line. So for example, if I looked at the parameters, here are the parameters here. These are the same ones up here in the control uh, panel. I can change them as well. I can go GUI.par.je equals zero. And I've set that JE value there back down to zero. So now, of course, I can put that in a loop. So I can say for JE equals zero, zero point one to five. I'll say gui.par.je equals our loop je, and I'll end that loop. And now I'm controlling the graphical user interface from the command line. So I can semi-automate the process. You can see je is changing here, and the simulation is updating as we go. And you can see the growth of that limit cycle through a hop bifurcation in this particular case. And there's our bifurcation diagram showing that growth in that limit cycle, the birth of that limit cycle from a fixed point. So I hope that gives you an idea of how using the toolbox is not just a graphical interface uh, that you're stuck with, but you can also automate that or semi-automate these investigations using these command line tools. And that, uh, that gets very handy for doing quick surveys to get to the core concepts or, or see the basic dynamics of what's going on with your particular system. Now, once we've built that bifurcation diagram, we can export that figure. That's a standard MATLAB figure. You can annotate that, do what you like with that uh, for publication or however you please. Now, you don't just have to use the, the graphical user interface. We can also do the same thing by closing this, uh, closing the graphical interface and using command line tools. So here's a short script I've written where I'm doing a similar thing. I'm loading that model up. I'm opening a window here, a MATLAB window. That's just standard MATLAB stuff. And here I have a loop where I'm looping through that JE parameter from 0 to 5. I'm setting that parameter in the system structure. I'm solving it. I'm taking, I'm evaluating E and I in time and plotting it. That's exactly what I did interactively and now I can do it using this um, automated script. There we have the same results as before. This is a bit quicker of course because we don't have those graphics to deal with. All right, so you can use the graphical interface, you can use the workspace interface, and you can use the command line tools. Uh, what time have we got? Four. All right. So I think I'll come back to the slides at this point. Um, so this is what I say. So the so it's not just a tool where you have a graphical user interface and you're stuck with that. You can automate your your um, studies using the uh, workspace interface, and then you can fully automate your surveys and large computations using scripts that don't use a graphical interface at all. And this represents the research development lifecycle or the the model building lifecycle, where you might do some interactive play. Uh, then you'll do some quick and dirty analysis uh, in a semi-automated fashion, and then you'll take that to a fully automated script, and you can uh, repeat this cycle as you need. 
And of course, once you've got your model working, you can ship that script that you've written, which defines the model uh, with your collaborators and also use the, the toolbox as a, a mechanism of dissemination. Uh, the toolbox comes with some online courses for for support. So if you go to bdtoolbox.org, there's a couple of online courses you can do. The toolbox basics course takes you through the business of just installing the toolbox and getting up and running with existing models, and that will take you. That's a, it's listed as a two-hour course, but it usually takes less. Uh, the modelers workshop is an eight-hour course. That's more extensive. And that takes you through the details of programming uh, your particular model of interest. Uh, there's also a 100 page handbook, uh, which uh, is uh, available from Amazon.com. Um, so that's the toolbox. It's essentially a equation centric software tool for simulating dynamical systems in neuroscience. Um, by equation-centric, I mean it gives you full control over your equations and uh, lets, uh, lets you define the equations. It doesn't impose any constraints on your equations, um, but it does take care of the business of calling the solver and plotting the results. So if you'd like to try it, go to bdtoolbox.org. Uh, you can subscribe to the newsletter and download that software for yourself. Okay, so that takes me back to the questions. I guess I should stop sharing. Okay, um, so we have a little delay on the video playing. Oh, okay. Could you uh, see it so, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, We have a couple of questions. One question is off the screen. Uh, coming from Ankur, I will read the question um, and then I will uh, invite people to the screen. Um, so great toolbox, thanks. Does the toolbox or are there any plans to support free open source platforms such that researchers without, to, without uh, MATLAB might perhaps be able to use it? Uh, um, or the not know Octave, or can it be called from Python, R, Julia, etc., for example? In other words, to not depend on uh, uh, entirely on MATLAB, which is not free for everyone. Yeah. Uh, the short answer is no. Um, it's pretty much stuck in MATLAB for historical reasons. Um, the, the only... The, it would require a complete rewrite to go to Python or something, so we have no plans for that. The only other option is if you have a friend with MATLAB, they could potentially export a model as a, um, a standalone executable, and you could try that. But really, uh, it really is designed for MATLAB users. Um, okay, uh, next question comes from uh, Parul Verma. Uh, you are invited on the screen. You can read the question. I, I can't see it. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, okay, he's coming. She is coming. Hello. Hi. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I had a quick question about the bifurcation implementation. So previously I have used MatCont and I was wondering what's the difference in the bifurcation analysis in BDT versus in MatCont and what are the features BDT provides versus what MatCont provides? Uh, the features, well, MatCont, MatCont is about uh, steady state system. So you converge to a steady state limit cycle and then you explore that. Uh, the BDT is a forward simulation system, so you start from some initial conditions and then converge. So when I did my, um, when I showed you those limit cycles, I trimmed off the transients. So I basically computed the full trajectory in time and then just threw away the first part of it. Uh, so MatCon will give you 
um, the ability to to analyze the bifurcation points. Um, I don't do anything like that in the Brain Dynamics toolbox. It's just a forward simulator. But uh, I would argue that it's a, it's a much easier to use simulator. <laughs> Thank you. OK. So uh, next question is also off the screen. Uh, Michael is asking, uh, in the toolbox, work with integrate and fire neurons, like the adaptive exponential neuron. Uh, these are usually 2D, but MATLAB doesn't do the discontinuities well, usually. If you want to do a discontinuous uh, system like that, you'll have to include some event handling in your MATLAB uh, ODE function. Um, the toolbox doesn't have that set up very well, so that is a bit of a problem in this case. That, this is a, a future feature that still has to be worked on. Um, so event handling would be when your, your, your membrane potential is rising up to a threshold and then your threshold uh, cor corresponds to some sort of spike. You would have an event handler there that says when the voltage potential reaches some threshold, then, then stop the solver reset your initial conditions and then continue. Uh, I haven't got that tested. It is planned, so it's a coming feature. Uh, next question also comes from Mike. Uh, can the toolbox generate a two-parameter bifurcation diagrams or calculate Lyapunov exponents or Poincaré maps? Doesn't have that. Um, you could create your own display panels to plot such a thing. Um, mm. That's another aspect of that uh, modular hub and spoke design is you can actually write your own display panels. So if you had a specific job in mind, you could write your own. That's a more complicated job, but it is possible. You can, use, you can even write your own solvers, in fact, as well. Uh, that was our last question. Um, if anyone has more questions, um, please go ahead and uh, post them on Neurostars. Um, and um, let's thank our speaker all the way from Sydney, Australia. <laughs> it's nice we are, uh, we ended today the day, we started the day today with a uh, tutorial from Australia and now we are ending the day with uh, two uh, showcases uh, uh, from Australia is very, very nice. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Stuart. So uh, hopefully we'll see you. So I'm going to invite on the screen uh, our next speaker. And uh, we do have a delay of uh, several seconds. Uh, so be patient. Uh, it happens. <laughs> um, Hello. I'm on the screen. We're not on the screen. Do you hear me? No. So that I'm connecting. Uh, a little connectivity issue, or just a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I reprompted. So, we will do the, the same, same structure. Please post, post questions. questions and we'll pick them up at the end. Hello, Janice. Hello. Uh, Dr. Dr. Gunai, Genghis Gunai is coming from Atlanta, US. Uh, so, so, I'm going to give him a, the microphone. Go Hello everyone, do you do you hear me? You need to turn off your mic, okay. 
Yeah, you did already. Uh, if you guys hear me, um, if you turn off your volume, I'll turn it on. Okay. Um, if you guys can hear me, then I can I can continue. Uh, thanks for having me here. I'm going to talk about uh, Mat also MATLAB toolbox. Uh, so this, you have two MATLAB toolboxes in a row. I know MATLAB is not the most popular uh, um, platform here. I mean, in general, I'm going to talk about it. There are reasons. Thank you, thank you, everyone, for uh, confirming. Uh, let me share my screen so we don't lose time. Hopefully, uh, mine is not going to be very long. Well, I think it's not the right one. One second. I think I'm gonna do my entire screen. Otherwise, I cannot do it. Okay. All right. I don't know. I hope they can see this. All right. Um. So um, I am from uh, Georgia Gwinnett College in uh, Georgia, uh, United States. Uh, but this toolbox was mainly developed uh, back at Emory University when I was a postdoc at Emory University. Um, uh, currently, uh, I'm still maintaining this toolbox. There have been some new stuff happening. Uh, not that much, though. But I am interested in um, contributing to the toolbox. And uh, if there are other people who may find it useful, I can keep on developing it and improving it. So uh, that's why I wanted to have this showcase to see if there's interest, if anyone interested in MATLAB and working in MATLAB environment. and to uh, to see um, if they are they are finding useful what we have to offer in this toolbox because there has been a lot of work and there's a lot of code and we do want to actually move to Python but we're not there yet we have some some stuff has been moved to Python but we're not there yet so let me just quickly introduce uh, to Pandora and before that let's have this discussion because I I heard the discussion in the other talk to people uh, have been moving on to other platforms um, rightfully. And uh, Python, for example, is much more um, extensible, it's free, you know, there's a lot of benefits. Um, so why should you use a MATLAB toolbox? I mean, one reason would be if you, um, if you are already using MATLAB, right? So if you're already in, in that environment. And the second reason would be if Python and other environments are too complex for you or unsustainable in your lab. And this happens in certain, certain conditions. Um, but yeah, seriously, why would anyone still use MATLAB, right? It's an ancient... Thing, you know, people have moved on. Uh, and if you're starting, if you're new in computational neuroscience, I'm not, I don't know if we have uh, people here. Uh, probably your best option is to go to Python. Right now, Python is probably the rising star. So if you're just starting new, don't start with MATLAB. I would recommend. But uh, there's a there's a problem with the Python environment is that it's, it's improved a lot. I mean, I I remember when Python was really hard to use a couple of years ago, but now it's like uh, there are many uh, tools out there to improve the usability, but there, there is still maintenance. Like there is, you still know to, need to know some computer stuff to handle like all those packages and upgrades and everything and make sure your code still runs. Uh, MATLAB is now, you know, it's private and it's, it's not free, so it's maintained by a company, which makes it a little bit more like um, uh, less, uh, less trouble for certain people. So, for example, non-programmer um, scientists communities, experimentalists prefer MATLAB, has, has been preferring MATLAB. Uh, so there is some audience for it. And if you want to, for example, collaborate with uh, um, experimentalists, if you give them like some complex Python code that requires like installing a lot of stuff, they're going to hate you, right? So there is MATLAB has some, still some niche. Uh, and, and the last point actually I want to make some people just can't quit it because they, they have legacy code in it. And especially certain labs, and they may have like out of written protocols and code that already do some analysis. So um, there are there could be reasons for staying in MATLAB for now. I know Octave is an, is an option. It, uh, for my specific toolbox, the Pandora toolbox, is incompatible with Octave because we, we are using the 
object-oriented features of MATLAB. And I lost MATLAB. Uh, I initially, I had Octave compatibility when I first started, but I lost it at some point and I, I couldn't keep up with it. So we just did in MATLAB, unfortunately. Uh, if you have questions, you I, I hope you're posting questions. I'm going to be checking uh, questions and you'll need to let me know if any, there's anyone uh, posting questions. I'm not seeing the chat on my screen right now. Let's, let's move on. Okay, so what is Pandora and um, why do we care? Um, it has like, it's it's been grown into like a, a big toolbox with many, many features. Uh, and there are several main features I want to mention, uh, but they're independent. These major features are independent. So you're not really limited to like just one type of data or analysis, but I'm going to tell you. So first one is, this is a special feature for electrophysics physiology. So unless if you're doing like single cell intracellular recordings and you have voltage traces from inside the cell, this is not going to be useful for you, right? If you have EEG or fMRI or if you're doing um, spike sorting, this is not it. This is not extracellular, this is intracellular. So if you have membrane voltage traces, we have uh, spike finding methods. We have like several, like about five methods in there. And there's like combined methods and there's a lot of options. It includes filtering of data. There's low pass, band pass, and high pass filtering. There's already like filtering implemented in there by default. But if you have data coming from a different animal, there's always like different types of features and you may need to do like different filtering for different animals. Um, and I can help with those things. So if you want to apply Pandora for a different type of data, I can, I can help you out initially because I've used it with, with very different types of data and it is able to find spikes in many different conditions. We also were used it for finding bursts. We, we used it in the leech. Uh, we had like bursting analysis. So there's code for finding bursts. And on top of this, we can add any custom measurement yourself. So once you have some intracellular traces, you can just measure anything out from it yourself. And again, this is not limited to intracellular traces if you're gonna write your own custom code. If you're, because Pandora is made to read files, analyze them and produce uh, some database format. I'm going to come to the database format. So it is made to process a large number of files automatically and produce uniform output. Um, I'm not taking questions as we go, right? Okay. All right. So if you have questions, just write them right now and we can, we, we can get back to them later. Um, so second major, major feature is this database uh, analysis. So first feature was like getting the properties, electrophysiological properties from some source. Um, and if you have custom code, you, it could be any source, any kind of data files, right? You can extract them. And the, once they're extracted, it comes into this database format. And database format is basically a data frame. If you if you are into Python, you should have heard about data frame. It's coming from the pandas uh, module. And if you know R, in R, data frames has been there for a while. So we're going to talk about that too. And it's basically, um, it's a tabular data and you can query it and you can plot it. So basically it makes a glue between MATLAB and this data frame and creates some nice um, uh, um, operations for you. And we have code for getting this intracellular traces into databases, but it can work with any type of data as long as you can extract uh, like a row of information from a file. And we have a lot of, info, uh, a lot of uh, statistical uh, calculations. M many of the MATLAB um, functionalities have been integrated. They have been adapted to this database analysis. So it it's works together. And I'll, I'm going to give you some examples. Third main uh, feature of the Pandora toolbox is the plotting. It's completely independent from the rest of it, but it's integrated. So once you have a database, when you plot the database, it's going to like use all the database labels, um, and they're going to be um, they're going to be nicely on the plot and um, so they're integrated. And if you plot a trace, for example, the voltage trace, it's gonna have the right units and everything. So all of those are integrated. But again, if you don't wanna use those things, the plotting functions are completely independent and can use them yourself. But why should you use them? Uh, because it improves the MATLAB uh, plotting. Uh, you can, there's some subplot functionality that is unique. Uh, you can stack subplots in different axes. You can stack them horizontally or vertically and it will automatically uh, control uh, the, you can actually ask it to use the same axes. For example, you can say this is a stack of plots, horizontal, and the left axis is the same for all of them. 
So it was just going to keep the leftmost axis and delete the other axes and reduce the space between the uh, subplots, which MATLAB doesn't do. MATLAB actually leaves a lot of extra space. So it will it allows you to control spacing between subplots and it allows you to render plot space on an export size. So you can actually specify export size like you can do in um, in Python, you can do it very easily, but in MATLAB it's kind of a pain. So this method is, has been known to produce publication quality figures, and I've been using it for many years in many papers, which I've linked from here. So these are my main three features, and this, been, this, this has been there for a while. Pandora started in like back in 2004, so it's ancient, but it has been, had updates and it has been uh, uh, maturing since then. Now, the newer features, which are like more recent, uh, there are like several new features, but they're not completely integrated. I'm just giving them to, to you here uh, in case you're interested, you need to contact me so we can I can let, help you out with these things because they're not um, uh, they're not as well documented as the original original features, but they, they work quite well. So first feature is this model simulation and parameter fitting. So MATLAB and model simulations sounds like a complete wrong thing to do, but in certain situations, for example, in the previous um, toolbox, you may want to like put some models in there and do uh, bifurcation analysis, right? So in, in my case, uh, I needed some model simulation, but very, very simple models, for example, single ion channels or like a passive membrane. Sometimes you want to simulate this to match like voltage traces, for example. For example, if you have voltage clamp or current clamp protocols and you're trying to fit uh, certain ion channel properties and find their parameters, you can use this uh, toolbox. But this toolbox works with Pandora it depends on Pandora, but this is a separate module. And one thing I did with this was compensating for serious resistance artifacts, uh, which is not completely published, but the code is out there, and I can also share some code with you. So there is some links for a paper, and there's a link to the actual code. But again, if you're interested in these things, you should probably contact me so I can help you out more. Second major new feature was um, a parameter optimization for more serious simulations. Uh, if you have like a large model, um, Pandora with this <coughs> module can call your simulator and call a sim optimization algorithm. For example, multi-objective evolution algorithm, swarm optimizations. Uh, and there are like a couple, like about a four or five different algorithms that you can pick from uh, using this godlike toolbox, which is, this is not the name I picked, Someone else made this toolbox in MATLAB, and uh, I just integrated Pandora with it. Um, and while I was doing that, I was able to make Pandora run external simulations. We were using Genesis, but you can use Neuron or any other simulator. It's just calling an external simulator. And this was published in the 2019 paper, and we have a link to the, a separate GitHub for this, uh, this feature. Um, in general, um, Pandora stuff is described originally in the 2009 paper. This was like for the first stable publication in neuroinformatics. And we have a GitHub repo where this is the most up-to-date version at this point. And there's a MathWorks file exchange um, page just, just for reference. If, um, and it points to the GitHub. It's linked to the GitHub, basically. So if you want to learn uh, more about Pandora, those are the main uh, references. Um, is, if there is any uh, questions at this point, okay. All right, so um, I mentioned like the general features and but just give you a more visual uh, idea of what's happening. So I mentioned like there are many data files and you extract, so these are the data files and I'm, these are the type of data I usually work with, the voltage, voltage traces, intercellular voltage traces. And if you have like many, many files, what Pandora does is that go, goes through all of them, calculates these measurements that you do, you selected based on like code, the code you provided or you selected from existing measurements, creates, creates these profile objects for each of those traces that contains all the details, characteristics, and then enters them into this tabular format, the table format, right? Like an Excel table. And, it's, uh, and then this is the data frame that I've been talking about, the parameters, and the measurements are next to each other, so those are the columns, and the individual rows are the different observations, which are the different files coming from these different files. And once you have this matrix, this uh, data frame object, which is labeled, and it has, um, um, it has these two types of data, 
then you can analyze and visualize it. And one more thing that I was able to do was actually um, keep a link to the original data files so that I can actually plot these original data traces if I needed to. For example, if you find something in the database, but then when you're working with experimental exper experimentalists, they will say, oh, where's the data? I want to see the data, right? And actually, if you're a good computational neuroscientist, you should always look at the data again. You should not just trust your algorithm because your algorithm may always do something wrong, right? So you should always go back to the original data. And this system also keeps a link to back to the data by keeping the names in, in some objects, and you can find them back from the analysis. And this analysis part is like histograms, bar plots, box plots, all of those things are in here. So that's the plotting I mentioned that is one of the major features. Uh, this is like the general um, workflow of Pandora. All right, so let me show you some examples, example workflows, and point out to the um, GitHub pages. So the, in the membrane voltage traces, uh, we can read many file formats from simulators, neuron genesis, and others, if it could be very easily added because we have a lot of support. And also like a bunch of uh, hardware manufacturers. So these are for like experimental data. Um, we were supporting NeuroShare at some point and a bunch of uh, different types of formats. And we also like accept text files with space um, separated or comma separated, and also HDF5 for input and output if, if necessary. I have a little link in here. So some of these slides, so all of the slides, the PDF of the slides are on my showcase website, which for which the link is on um, the shed page. And each of these uh, our tutorials are pointing to my, uh, the GitHub repo. And you can see the tutorial is something like this. So it's basically like a notebook. It tells you like what you need to load. The file is actually available here. <laughs> and then step by step, like how we can create an object. So let me actually go through the code a little bit if I have time or I'm out of time. Oh, okay. So, okay, let me start from the top. So we're setting like the time resolution, the DT and the DY is the, the unit. So actually one thing that Pandora provides you is the units and it makes sure that you don't mess up your units and it shows up in all the graphs and all the reports. Uh, this is the filtering I mentioned for spike finding. So for this specific um, file that I'm loading, I want to set the spike finder to a specific type of spike finder and set up a new threshold. So this is very customizable and you can, that's why I said it can find spikes in different animals. Then you create this trace object from the, the file. This is the file name and this is the DT and DY and then you give the name. So the names and labels are always like inside these objects so that when you create a plot, it's not going to be like an unlabeled plot. It's going to be my test trace on it. And you can see down here, this is the my test trace and it will also show up as a title in here. If you want, you can remove that. So this is the plotting I mentioned. It will put the units. These are automatic. It will put in millivolts and milliseconds. And you can set it to seconds or volts or whatever, and then like um, smaller units than millivolts if you want. Those are all available and it will automatically calculate and zoom into it. Um, before I get to that, so once you do this command, when you create the trace object, it will look like this. So it was going to tell you like what's inside the trace object. It's basically a simple object with all the data that you just put in. And once you say plot, uh, this is the regular plot command in MATLAB, but I overloaded it, right? So it's, this object has an overloaded ma plot method that creates this, this plot with all the labelings and scale. So you don't have to like set any of these things. So it's just one, one function will create this nice plot. So it's made for this type of data. Um, and these are the other formats that you could choose. You know, there are some old, um, simulators like Genesis in here, but it accepts neuron files and um, MATLAB files, NeuroShare files, ABF files from Exoclamp. So those are very common formats. Um, there are some extra stuff and usually like it's accepts by default, it assumes all data is recorded at 10 kilohertz, but if it's different, then you'll have to change the filtering. So it will give an error and it will tell you like what to do. And you just have to set up like a custom filter. It will create a filter for it. 
All right, so that was um, the loading the data trace, and then you can find the spikes on it. So when you find spikes, it's, this was actually from Pandora. It will like annotate it like this. It will show you the width of the spike at the base, the height of the spike, and this after hyperbolization depth, for example. And in in a bigger trace, you can see all of them like this. So you can see in immediately if it missed the spike or something is wrong, you will see it immediately. And there are lots of parameters you can customize so that it will get it correctly. Um, and you can, the nice thing about this is that it's all made so that it will get automatically pr process a large number of files. So once you get it right, then you can give it like 100 files. It's going to do it all, all for all of them. And again, like there's a link in here. If you click on this, you know, go to the next tutorial, find spike times. They're also like all in a row actually in there. And um, so all you have to do is run on that trace object, run the spikes command. It's going to find the spikes, and if you plot them, it's going to plot them as like single peaks. And um, oh, this is actually the actual trace. I'm showing the spikes on it. This is the filtered version. So this is kind of like how it works. It will first filter the data and then find the spikes. And it's a complicated process, but it actually goes through like two or three passes over the data to make sure to get the right spikes. Um, this is a spike uh, frequency versus time, like over time, how the spike frequency is changing. This is the inter-spike intervals over time. Okay. So, um, so those are my two examples for the membrane, the voltage traces. Now, if you're more interested in just the database part of the, or do you get that data and now you go to the database part, let's talk about that. And I, I, I think I already told you like what this is, so I'm gonna kind of skip over this. The database analysis is basically labeling columns and rows of a numerical mat, mat, matrix, okay? And by doing that, all those plots and um, analyses will get those labels so that you don't make a mistake. Like when you mean TTX, you don't get the wrong column and you get the actual next value or something. So everything becomes more readable. You're more sure of what you're doing. And all these labels propagate into plots and reports to reduce errors, basically. And it's, it just makes a better, uh, better experience. People who are using data frames will know this. And obviously, like, as I said, it's not new. R had this data frame concept since a long time. And Python acquired data frames with the pandas package, right? Which incidentally, is, it was, it came around the same time as Pandora, maybe a little bit later than Pandora, a couple of years later. Which also, funny coincidence, they have, we have like similar names for these two packages. But I'm not aware of any, any other relationship between the two of us, so I don't. I don't think uh, we communicated with each other. I think it was a similar idea. And I think it, you can see the trend because MATLAB also introduced a table command recently, much later than Pandora. And they have some functionality of like this database object, the table object. But Pandora still offers benefits because it's an indicating environment for this neuroscience analysis. It has all the units and everything. and. Um, Okay, so let me show you how, <clears throat> how it works. So for example, if you wanna create like a two by two data frame or database, okay? So we have two rows and two columns and there's the data inside. This is how you do it. So you create an object. So this is our variable. The, the name of the object is not data frame, it's called tests DB. This is the most basic uh, database object in the Pandora. And you give the matrixes as, as like this in the square brackets. Then you label the columns and then you label the rows and then give it a name. So this is the whole name of the object. This is a label for the object. Um, and you can import a text file and make a database like this, or Excel from Excel. Um, so there's, there's nothing special in there. It's just a simple way of using data frames in MATLAB. And, um, but the nice thing is when you process these data files, right? We talked about like extracting spikes and stuff. And this is how that works. So you basically, we have different data set classes and you can actually load a um, set of files and this is the um, star.bin will like capture a bunch of files, right? 
and you give it all these arguments, and this has become your data set. So this will hold a link to all your files. And then this step in one step is going to process all of them. So this step may take hours. If you have like thousands of files, this may take hours. But it's going to process all of them automatically and create this database object, which will be the same as what you saw the, this two by two object that you saw in the previous slide. And once you have the database, you can do operations on them. For example, you can sort by rows, the database object, by amplitude, right? And it's going to return a new value because MATLAB is called by, um, always called by value, although it does some call by reference tricks, okay? Uh, and once you have the database, that's, that's a sorting example, but we can also query. So in, data, in, in MATLAB, indexing is done with the regular parentheses, not square brackets. So this will say, take the first 10 rows from rows from one to 10. This is the same as in Python, right? In Python, you also use the colon. And um, in the second argument, now we have curly braces. So this is something weird, right? So in MATLAB, curly braces says uh, cell array, meaning that you can put like text in it. You can, so this is a two element cell array. And basically I'm saying, I'm gonna take the first 10 rows and only the two columns, the neural index column and the fire rate column. Now, I hope you can see that how the labels are useful, right? Instead of just saying column number two, column number three, I'm saying them by name so I know exactly what type of data I'm getting. So the code is much easier to understand and interpret. And you can, I think you can do this in Python too. You can label, you can address um, columns by name and same in R. And here's the filtering uh, um, command. So now you can see, I want to filter only the neuron index 46. So I want to just get the 46 in here. So I have to do two operations. So I do one operation to get the true false logical array. And then I use that to index the same object. And this is again the same in, as far as I know, this is the same in, in Python. You have to do something similar like this in Python to, for indexing. So all of these are special Pandora uh, overloaded operations. So we overloaded all like these parentheses and square, uh, curly braces and square, uh, not square brackets, we don't have square brackets. Uh, another query in here, this is a OR operation. So it will check for three different neuron indexes. So if the neuron index is any of these values, then it's gonna be found, right? So this is a more complex operation, it's an OR operation. Instead of checking with a single value, you have three values to check from. And here is a more complex, um, well, more like a, um, it's nothing different in here, it's just a combination of several um, conditions and they are uh, concatenated together with an AND and an OR operator. And notice that these are single AND and OR, so these are bitwise or logical operators. So first we're saying we want everything except number 46, all neuron indexes, except number 46, because a tilde is the not operator in MATLAB, which is annoying, but that's what it is. And then there's another parenthesis with a subgroup in here. And in those elements, we want the CIP, which is the injection, current injection parameter to be bigger than 100, or we want the firing rate to be less than 50. So this is a combined uh, conditional operation. And last one in here, this was another OR operation. Now this is special because in the previous OR operation, we were giving a fixed three elements, but here I'm comparing two different databases. So I'm comparing one database to another database. So this is like a cross, cross join operation. So it's not called join, but it is a cross join operation. So it will find all the ones that match, match the other database. And I have a tutorial here, but I'm not gonna click on it because I don't want to take up too much time. I'm out of time, right? Five more minutes. Okay, so you can click on those and just let me know. There's a Neurostars link in our sketch page. You can post on Neurostars or you can post questions right now. Here are some graphs that are produced from these database analysis. You can see like, this is some experimental data actually. It was um, the tetrotoxin was applied to a, a neuron and then we were measuring the firing rates. And this, this graph was produced completely into Pandora and it was very easy to set it up. This is a bar graph, regular bar graph with the uh, uh, lines and, and values. All of these are options in Pandora. And this is a 
um, box plot. Again, like it's very easy to get a box plot out of a database. Here's how a database looks like when you print it out in MATLAB. So now I'm gonna confuse you because these are my columns. So these are supposed to be, they look like rows, right? These are rows, but they're actually columns because when I print in Pandora, I print them in transpose because it's much easier to show many, many, many data rows in here. So these vertical things are actually rows, but it's easier to print them out like this because I can write the text in the in a horizontal format. Uh, but it doesn't change the, the fact that the data is actually in, in vertical format. But here you can see some, this is an experimental data that you just saw the, the graph from. There are different chem, uh, chemicals applied to uh, a preparation. Um, and this is the different experiments. So this is experiment 107 or neurons 107, 108 and 110, 110. And these are the firing rates measured for these different combinations. Now, if I want to focus on TTX, I can just extract the TTX column. And I do a, an anal analysis of um, multivariate analysis. So Pandora has this, this is like a group by operation, okay? So we group by different values of everything else, the, the background. For example, in these two cases, like TTX goes from zero to seven, when all of the rest are the same, right? Except the measurements, all the parameters, sorry. So this, the page one will be that case. And this is a different case where, uh, this is a different neuron, right? So we cannot pull this neuron, that neuron together. This is a separate, uh, measurement and this is another separate measurement so basically based on the neuron id it creates three different pages of the same data repeated so this is a three-dimensional uh, matrix so pandora uses a three-dimensional matrix to do this and once you have the three-dimensional matrix you can do change in rate so for example we had those three pages what is what was the change in the uh, rate in in each of them. I'm going back. So if you see like going, the rate was going from 25 to 19, so that's negative. 29 to 22 also negative, and 22 to 20. So if we go next, we saw, we see those numbers, the difference from one to two. And it will tell us which page it came from. So you can see there are some like complex analysis in this toolbox that helps you to do these like database operations like that you know from SQL and from other packages like joining, group by, and these combined with like computational, scientific computational analyses. And here's my regrouping to find the average values. So now I'm um, transposed in three dimensions to get the first values versus second values for each neuron. So now I can average these things separately. Okay, so I can say all the neurons Add for their zero values or these rates and the second in here, and then I can produce basically it produces this graph. This is the average graph. Okay. All right. So as conclusion, um, I have the links for the main 2009 publication. It's ancient, but you know it's the if you want to like use Pandora, you can cite this. It will be nice if you can cite it. Um, the main uh, documentation is on GitHub and the MathWorks file exchange pages. You can follow them. Um, if you want to give me feedback, ask questions, you can open issues on GitHub or you can start my project or you can watch it. Uh, I'm also looking for developers to improve it right now and improve the documentation. There's a lot of functionality that's kind of hidden. It could actually help a lot of people, but it's not well documented and explained. So I can definitely help you guys out if you have a task and maybe it could be a win-win for, for the project. And please email me at this address. And please, please, please fill my survey. Okay, I have the survey here and also on the shed page. Uh, please do that survey for me. I'm gonna post it on, oops. If I can click on this, I'm gonna post it on the, um, on this thing, of course, Crowdcast, sorry. I want to just give credit to Dieter Yag and Astrid Prince in whose labs I was working on Pandora and I was working on their projects. And there's more contributors on the GitHub page. And we have an RRID. If you use Pandora in your paper, please cite our RRID and also the, the main publication. Okay. Thank you very much. That's all I have.
So if you have questions, I can take them now if you still have time. I should mute myself. Okay. I need. Oh, you killed me. So we are not late. Okay, I can answer the question. I saw the question. Camilla is asking if she's using WaveSurfer and the data is in HDF5 format. If I will be get the data from one file with several sweeps, yes. We already actually have ABF files with many out of stuff in there. I think I think you can hear me now, right? I was on mute, but now I'm not. So I think you can hear me now. So the answer is yes to Camilla because we uh, have done that before with other data formats and we have HTF5 formats. Um, one second. Um, okay, yeah, next one. Next question is, um, I don't think that's a question for me. I think that's for the previous uh, member. And that's Terence Michael Wright. Hi, Ter Hi, Michael. Thank you, Stewart, for confirming that. Um, are there other questions for me? Because I think there were questions from the previous talk. So let's thank Chengiz. Um, we don't want to be later than this. We're already 20 minutes past the deadline. Um, please post all your questions that you might have for uh, him or for the other speakers on uh, Neurostars. Um, and I want to take uh, this opportunity to thank all our speakers and uh, especially the showcase speakers, the tutorial speakers, and the keynote speakers for today. We had a great program, great start of the conference. And um, I would like to thank all of you for participating and everyone who participated to our tutorials day. And I'm inviting you to come back tomorrow when the real conference starts. We have a great series of uh, talks aligned, uh, starting with a uh, feature talk, uh, followed by uh, orals, keynote speaker, and um, we have a session, a full session of three hours of posters. And we will end up the day tomorrow night with the CNS party. So everyone, thank you for coming, and I hope you had a great Neuroscience Day, and I hope to see you all tomorrow. Cheers. Mm -hmm.